Okay, <clears throat> we're going to look tonight at John on the island of Patmos, and uh, there in Revelation chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Now, we've been studying all the way through the book of Revelation, verse by verse by verse, yes? And tonight we're going to look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Study the Bible. I've encouraged you to study the Bible for yourself, right? Is that true? And so we need to study the Bible for ourselves. So we're going to go to the Bible tonight. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. It starts off, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, we've already covered in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and verse 4 of this very thing, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it tonight. Do you remember when Jesus was walking and he was with his disciples and the Bible says, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying unto them, whom do men say that I am? Now Jesus is asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? Now, it's interesting because we want to know who is Jesus. Now, I've already done parts in Revelation chapter 1 on who is Jesus. I've already done that. So we've already got a background of that. I'm going to uh, refresh our minds tonight on some of this. So we're asking the question again, who is Jesus? Well, the Bible says in John 7, 46, the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. You see, now, when I speak or when you speak, yeah, that's something. But there's something about Jesus that when he speaks, it's different than what we speak or how we speak. They notice there's something about it. Nobody has ever spoke like this man before in reference to Jesus. Now, Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? But notice carefully what Jesus says about himself in the book of Revelation. Jesus says some things about himself. Not just what other men say or not what other people say, but Jesus himself says some things about himself. Notice saying in Revelation 1.11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So Jesus is saying this very thing about himself. Matter of fact, we know so because in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, the Bible says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now John's describing this encounter with Jesus. And he says when he sees him, he falls at his feet as dead. And as he laid, what did he do? And he laid his hand, right hand upon me, this person John is seeing, saying, this person speaking to John is saying unto him, that is John, he says, said unto me, fear not, I am what? The first and the last. Now this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus is saying, I am the first and the last. Now I can't say that. I'm not the first and the last. You can't say that. Friends, only God could say he's the first and the last. This isn't just some kind of attribute or characteristic. This being saying this very thing is none other than God himself saying, I am the first and the last. And we're going to see that as we continue on. Now this person speaking to John says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. We know that's clearly talking about Jesus. Now, God's divine nature doesn't die, does he? God doesn't die. But humanity is what died on the cross. Now, let's look at it carefully. In Revelation twenty-two thirteen, Jesus is speaking and Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and and the last. This is Jesus talking about himself in the book of Revelation. Jesus is saying this. Okay? 
Now, let's look at the divine nature. We're going to go back to Genesis. Remember, Revelation is last here. Genesis is the beginning. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to look at some things about the divine nature. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, who created? God created. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now here, for the first time in the entire Bible, first time you have the word Lord. By the way, in Genesis chapter 1 alone, God, Elohim, is mentioned 32 times. Isn't that amazing? In the first chapter. 32 times in one chapter, Elohim, God, is mentioned. But now for the first time in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, the word Lord, the Lord God. Now the word Lord, there comes from the Hebrew that they translate Yahweh or Jehovah, Yahweh. And so that's the word Lord. And I've mentioned this before. Most generally, when you find the word Lord all capitalized, that comes from the Hebrew Having, having the meaning of, as they translate, Jehovah or Yahweh. Okay? And uh, when you have capital L with lowercase o-r-d, that's usually translated from the Hebrew word Adonai. So when you see this, that's referring to Yahweh or Yahweh or Jehovah. And notice how it says, the day that the Lord, that's Yahweh, God, made the earth and the, and the heaven. So who made it? That's right, Lord, Yahweh God, Yahweh, or Jehovah as they say. Okay, so here we have it, <clears throat> the Lord, that is Jehovah or Yahweh, God made the earth and the heavens. <clears throat> now the Bible says in Isaiah 26, 4, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, that's Jehovah there, or Yahweh, he is who? Who is he? He's God. So this Jehovah, this Lord, is this Elohim, this God. Yes or no? Isn't that what the Bible says? And then he goes on to say, there is none else beside him. So you only have the Lord Jehovah, and this Lord Jehovah, he is God, Elohim, know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, that is Jehovah, he is God, where? In heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. So this Lord, Jehovah, is this God, correct? Okay? Because remember, we're looking at the divine nature, remember that. Remember, we're looking at the divine nature. Thus saith the Lord, that's Jehovah speaking, Yahweh, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord, that's Jehovah, that maketh what? All things. So who makes all things? Jehovah. Who makes all things? That word Lord is Jehovah. So I am Jehovah. That's what he's saying. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah that maketh what? All things. So who makes all things? Jehovah. That's not a trap question. That's not a trick question. The Bible tells you who makes all things? The Lord who is who? Jehovah. That's his name. Okay, by the way, he goes on to say, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. So did the Lord Jehovah do it all by himself? Yeah. Then he says that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Did Jehovah make the earth by himself? Yeah. That's what he says. That's what he says. For thus saith the Lord, that is Jehovah, that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth. By the way, didn't we just read that Jehovah is the one who made the earth, right here. And he did it by himself, right? 
So for thus saith the Lord, that is Jehovah, that created the heavens, God himself, that formed the earth, made it. He hath established it, he created it, not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, I am Jehovah, and there is none else. So Jehovah is God who created the heavens and the earth. Yes or no? Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, and recompense says the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children. After them, the great, the mighty God, the Lord Jehovah, that is the Lord, Jehovah is the Lord, of hosts is his name. So what is the great, right there, this being Jehovah? Question. Is it? Yes, it is. Okay. So the Bible, in reference to his divine nature, the Bible clearly proves that God created. Correct? The Bible clearly proves that Jehovah is God. Correct? The question we need to answer from the Bible, does the Bible actually call Jesus God? Does it? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Does the Bible actually call Jesus Jehovah? Let's see. If the Bible does prove that Jesus is God, then Jesus is also Jehovah, because in the Bible, Jehovah is God, and Jehovah is the name given to God. Yes or no? Yes. Notice how the Bible describes this in reference to Jesus in 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who's this talking about? Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. In other words, Jesus was in the flesh, yes or no? Yes. And yet the Bible says God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And that's talking about Jesus. And the Bible refers to Jesus as what? God was manifest in the flesh. For in him, Jesus that is, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So where does Jesus dwell? Jesus dwells in the Godhead, yes? So, number one, is Jesus God? Number two, is Jesus Jehovah? And number three, is Jesus the Creator? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, in the beginning, who's the Word? Jesus. And the word Jesus was with God. And the word, who is who? Jesus was God. Now we're not, in this study, we're not talking about little God, little G-O-D. We've already covered all that, haven't we? As if you were talking and studying with Jehovah's Witnesses or anti-Trinitarian groups. We've already covered that very thing thoroughly. Okay, and so what we see here, the word is Jesus. And I've mentioned in the Greek, the word here for with refers to the relationship within the, the Godhead, not in chronology as being with one person with another. We're talking about in relationship. And the word Jesus was God. The same was in the beginning with God, that is, has always been in that close relationship, not at some point created. I know sometimes people go to Proverbs chapter 8. By the way, when people do that, they don't realize what they're saying when they go to Proverbs chapter 8 to show that, show that Jesus was created and he came forth at some point in time beginning as if that was a time he came into existence. That's a problem, you see, because the Hebrew word for proverb, you know what it is? Mashal, Hebrew means mashal, that's the word used for proverb. 
And you know what the, the Greek equivalent to that is? Parabole, parable. The book of Proverbs is full of parables. You see, matter of fact, when you read Proverbs chapter 8, clearly, starting in verse 1, working through it, you see a parable all the way through Proverbs chapter 8. It's amazing. So anyway, we've already covered some of that. So the same was with, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. So who did the creating here? Some people say, well, made's different create. That's true. But we're going to see that Jesus actually created and not just made. We're going to see he did both of those things. Just like in Genesis chapter 1. You find both created, bara, and you find made, asa. And both of those words are in Genesis chapter 1. So here we find that this very being is the one who created what? Made all things were made by him, through him all things were made. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So here we find all things. But when we went to the Old Testament, we found out that it was Jehovah who created all things, didn't we? Right? Now we come to the New Testament and we find that Jesus is the one who made all things. Now, <clears throat> notice how Colossians 1.16 describe it. Here's where he gets into created. For by him, that is Jesus, were all things what? Created. You see, so people want to say, well, there's a difference between made, which there is, okay, then created. But Jesus didn't only make all things. For by him, Jesus, were all things what? Created. These are two different Greek words. If you want to look that up, you check it out. There's a different word here for created and made. You need to check that. It's in Colossians 1.16. Okay, so for by him, Jesus, were all things created that are where? In heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, that is Jesus, and for him. Now, when we understand this text properly, we see that it was Jesus who created Lucifer. Yes? It was Jesus who created Lucifer. Because it says, for by him, that is Jesus, were all things created. And what? That are where? In heaven. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him. That is through him. That is Jesus and for him. So when we go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, that is Jesus, created the heaven and the earth. Yes or no? Was Jesus in creation? Yes, he was. Was Jesus there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Yes, he was. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, that is Jehovah, he is God. And who is this God that we just talked about who created everything? Jesus. And if this Jesus is this God, then certainly this Jesus is this who? Jehovah. Lord Jehovah. It was Jesus who created Adam. Yes or no? Remember, we're talking about the divine nature. It was Jesus who was with Adam and Eve. Could you imagine what, how beautiful it was back then? Oh, even the most beautiful sight on our earth today wouldn't even come compare, even close to what it must have looked like in the Garden of Eden in the creation. It was Jesus who created the beautiful garden as their dwelling place. He, reference to Jesus, was in the world and the world was made by Him. That is Jesus. And the world knew Him not. That's John chapter 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> now, when we look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, Isaiah says... Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord Jehovah, the Creator. Now remember, we've read texts already that showed that this Lord Jehovah Creator did it with nobody else. He did it by himself, alone. 
Okay? And notice how he describes this. The everlasting God, the Lord Jehovah, that is the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now notice how the Bible describes this. Isaiah 43, 15. I am the Lord, that is Jehovah, for the word Lord there, that's Jehovah. Your Holy One, the Creator. Now friends, we don't have a person who's not God creating. There's only one who created. Not one who's God and one who is not God. Nor is it one who is God, capital G, and one who is God, little g, little g-o-d. This Holy One is the creator of Israel, your king. By the way, in the New Testament, how does the Bible describe Jesus in the New Testament? In the book of Revelation, as king of kings, and what? Lord of lords. New Testament, book of Revelation. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? One God created us. Not three gods created us. Not 15 gods. One God created us. Now Jesus is either this one God who created us or he's not. Don't say Jesus created Adam if he's not God. Because only one God did what? Create us. Correct? This God is none other than Jesus. That made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he, that is Jesus, is Lord of heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Thus saith the Lord. Thy Redeemer. Isn't Jesus our Redeemer? Thus saith the Lord. That word for Lord is Yahweh, Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah, thy Redeemer. And he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord. If Jesus is God, he is this Jehovah. Yes or no? That maketh what? All things. And we learn that Jehovah is the one who created. Jehovah is the one who made all things. He didn't need anybody else to help him. He didn't need to go through somebody else. He did it by his own self. That's how the Lord Jehovah did it. That stretcheth forth the heavens alone. That spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. That is Jehovah. Jesus must be Jehovah if Jesus is God because Jehovah is God. And there's only this God, Jehovah, who created all things. And the Bible says Jesus created all things. Jesus must be this God. Jesus must be this Jehovah. And there is no other. He did it by himself. For thus saith the Lord, that is Jesus, that created the heavens, God, Jesus himself, that formed the earth and made it. He established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now if Jesus is not Jehovah, he's somebody else. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. No little God, no big God, no other God besides me. I girded thee though... Thou hast not known me. So looking at the divine nature, we find Jesus as the creator. Yes or no? We do, don't we? From the Bible. Jesus is Jehovah God, the creator of all things. <clears throat> now let's do some comparing here. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Psalms chapter 35, verse 23, Jehovah is in the context. That is the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. You see the word for Lord, if you looked it up in Hebrew, is the term for Jehovah. Yahweh. You know that, right? Okay? So here we find a passage where David is crying out to Yahweh. David is crying out to Jehovah. David is crying out to the Lord. And notice what David says. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment. Even unto my cause, my God 
and my Lord. Now David is calling out to who? Jehovah. This Jehovah is the God David is calling to. This Jehovah is the Lord that David is calling to. Now let's go to the New Testament. John chapter 20 verse 28. And watch what happens. Thomas sees Jesus a week or so after the resurrection. And Thomas says to Jesus, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Isn't that amazing? He's saying the same exact thing. The only reversal in it is David cries out, My God and my Lord. Thomas cries out, My Lord and my God. They're saying the same exact thing. They're meaning the same exact thing. Yes or no? Yes. Well, let's look at the Septuagint. In the Old Testament Greek text, you have in Psalms 35, 23, you have in the Greek, ha theosmu, kai ha kyriosmu. That is my God and my Lord. My God and my Lord. Now, that's with David and Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord. Now when we go to the Greek New Testament, in John chapter 20, verse 28, we have Thomas doing the same thing that David did with Jehovah. Thomas is doing with Jesus. And notice what Thomas, how the Bible describes this. Ha kurios mu kai ha theos mu mu. And he's saying, my Lord and my God. See that? My Lord and my God. Now this is Thomas saying this to Jesus. Okay? Now, what do you have here in the Septuagint? Hathiasmu. You have the same thing in reference to Jesus. New Testament. Hathiasmu. See that? My God. My God. Then you have the same thing in reverse over here. My Lord, ha kyriosmu, ha kyriosmu, my Lord. See that? So he's saying the same thing. So David is saying the same thing to Jehovah that Thomas is saying to Jesus. My God. So Thomas is calling Jesus God. Theos. He's calling... Thomas is calling Jesus that. You see, if you would call me that or I would call you that, that's blasphemy. See, and Jesus never repudiated that or, or got upset with Thomas and say, oh, no, no, don't call me God. Don't do that. Don't call me that. He didn't. See, and yet Thomas is saying the same thing to Jesus that David did to Jehovah. Same thing. See, you find in the Old Testament, in Psalms 35, 23, Jehovah, ha theosmu. Same exact thing in the New Testament that Thomas is saying to Jesus. He's calling Jesus my God. Now, let's look at some more examples here of what I'm talking about. So we find here that the Father is God. For example, the text says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Now here's a very important point. Is this Father this God? Yes or no? Yes. This Father is this God. Correct? Now people who are anti-Jesus being God don't deal with these texts and justify a reason for not accepting the fact that Jesus is God based on the same grammatical structure in the Greek language. Watch this. Remember, our Father is this God. Yes or no? Now let's look at one about Jesus. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. My question is, is this Jesus, our Jesus, this Lord, this God? Yes. Same thing. Same exact thing. For example, 
In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, the text we're quoting, to theu kai patros, this father is this God. Correct? Now watch this. Same thing about Jesus. Jesus is God just like the Father's God. The God and Jesus. You see that? You see the structure? Now, this is a noun, Father, and this is a noun, Jesus. Okay? Now, what's interesting is this is the same identical structure as this. Identical. See, you just have a different word, Father, which is a noun, masculine noun, and you have Yesu, which is a masculine noun. Now, if indeed this Father was not this God, there would be another article here. If indeed this Jesus is not this God, there would be another article right here to show two distinct different beings. And I'll go more into that when I show you more about it. Now notice in verse 4 of Galatians chapter 1, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Is this Father this God? Yes or no? Okay. What about Jesus? The same construction. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is this Lord Jesus this God? By the way, it's interesting that punctuation is not inspired in the Bible. They could have easily put a comma there or easily omitted it in either one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Punctuation is not inspired. Okay? And so sometimes that confuses people, doesn't it? As if this is something different than this. But it's not. Same construction here as you have here. Same identical construction in the, in the biblical Greek language. Same thing. See, over here you have Father is God. This Father is this God. Not something separate, but is. Okay? This Jesus right here, this Christu, is this Theu. See that? Same thing. Tu Theu Kai Patras. Tu Theu Kai Christu. If indeed this Christ is not this God, there would be an article here as well. Just like that. To show two distinct beings. Okay? Let's look at another case in point. You see, the word for God is a masculine noun. The word for Lord is a masculine noun. And the word for Jesus and Christ are masculine nouns. Same Greek construction. Identical. And notice, it says here, for so in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My question is, is this Savior Jesus Christ this Lord, or is he something different? This Savior is this Lord. Okay? Let's look at 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now guess what? Watch this very carefully. 2 Peter 1.11 To Kiryu, Hamon, Kai, Soterios, Yesu. So you have Lord, our Lord, and Savior Jesus. Is this Savior Jesus this Lord? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Look at 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. To Theu, Hamon, Kai, Soterios, Yesu. That is identical to this. The only difference is you have the masculine noun Lord, and here you have the masculine noun God. It's the only difference. The whole construction of that statement, that phrase, is identical. Identical. Okay? See that? Identical. Okay? So in other words, this Savior here is this God, not something separate. If this Savior here is not this God, there would be the article with the Savior over here. This article. Right here. It would go like this. To Theu, Hamon, Kai, Soterios, to. Yesu. 
Sometimes you may even have the article right here. But the article would be implying that this being is separate from this being, not, th not one and the same being. You see? But this is one and the same. In other words, this God is this Jesus, the Savior. Okay? Now, let's move on in reference to the divine nature. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now, this is John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. He sees Jesus. Jesus is speaking with him. And John falls at his feet as if he's dead. And he laid his right hand, this, this person who laid his right hand upon me, John says, the one speaking to me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, Revelation 1.17 is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one that says, I am the first and the last. Not John, not an angel. Nobody else says that. Jesus is saying, I am the first and the last. Now let's go to Isaiah 44, 6 of the Old Testament. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord. You know what that word for Lord is? That's Jehovah, correct? That word Lord is capitalized. That's Yahweh, King of Israel, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. So Jehovah, this Lord, is the first and the last. Yes or no? So now if Jesus is not Jehovah, if Jesus is not God, if Jesus is not this Lord, then we have two different beings claiming to be the first and the last. Now look, I can't say I'm the first and the last. You can't say you're the first and the last. But just for illustration, if I said I'm the first and the last, and Bruce, you said you're the first and the last, that's a problem. Which one is really the first and the last? Is the Lord Jehovah or is Jesus? Because Jesus says he's the first and the last. Now if Jesus is not Jehovah, if Jesus is not the Lord, then he's something else. He's claiming to be the first and the last. Which of those two different beings am I to believe? I believe Jesus and Jehovah is one and the same being. Not two different beings. Okay? Because they both claim to be what? The first and the last. See, what, what Jesus is in the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament. And there's so many parallel passages from the Old Testament in the New Testament that you could clearly see that when the Old Testament is referring to the Lord Yahweh, Jesus is that in the New Testament. Jesus is God. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is the Lord. And we're going to see pretty soon where we're going to find the text where Jesus is actually called Jehovah in the Bible. Okay? So notice what he says. The Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. No little g, no other big g, no other God. No one besides this one who claims to be the first and the last. Now, notice how Isaiah 41, 4 says it who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. Was Jesus in the beginning with Adam and Eve? Did Jesus create Adam and Eve? So from the very beginning, by the way, the generations didn't start with Moses. The generations didn't start with Abraham. The generations didn't start with Noah. The generations from the beginning started with who? Adam. And this person here, this being, is saying, from the beginning, I, the Lord, that's Jehovah, that's Yahweh, the first, and with me, and with the last, I am He. Now that little phrase right there is what Jesus says in the New Testament. Remember when Jesus is talking with this woman at the well. And then what does Jesus say? I am He. The I am statements of the New Testament is Jehovah Yahweh, the I am of the Old Testament. So when we go to the Greek New Testament, we see Jesus in Revelation 1.17, Ego, Ami, Ha, Protos, I am the first. Now, Ami, you could say the same thing without the word Ami. It's just a present tense meaning I am. Present tense right now. See, 
the meaning doesn't even change if you just say I the first. Ego ha protas. Doesn't change the meaning. He's simply saying that he's first. Okay? When you go to Isaiah 41, 4, in the Old Testament, you have in the Septuagint, ego, hathios, protos. In other words, he just doesn't use the word ami as am in the present. He just simply says, ego, hathios, protos. So God is saying, I, God, is who? The first. He's the first. Okay? So here you have Jesus in the New Testament, Revelation 1.17, saying he's the first. And you have God in the Old Testament saying he's the first. So do we have two firsts or we do have one? And that one is the same being. One creator, one God, one first and last. Not two different first and last. You see, this title isn't just a attribute of Jesus uh, of God you and I aren't the first we're not the first and the last how is Jesus the first and the last as just maybe an attribute no he is Jehovah who is the first and the last he is God who is that for example Revelation 22 13 is Jesus speaking Revelation 22 13 and Jesus says ego ha protos kai ha eschatos I am the first and the last. Revelation 22, 13. Septuagint, Isaiah 44, 6. Ego ha protos kai ha eschatos. I am the first and the last. We find that in Isaiah 44, 6. Now friends, Jehovah who is God isn't just one first and last. And then Jesus over here who's not God the first and the last. It's only God, the divinity of God, who could actually say he's the first and the last. None, no, nothing other than God could say that. Follow me? Lucifer, Satan himself, cannot say he's the first and the last. Lucifer. He cannot say he's the first and the last. Because he wouldn't be the first and the last because God was before him. God created him. And we read in the New Testament that Jesus created all things. Principalities and powers. Where? In heaven and on earth. It was Jesus who created Lucifer. Isn't that amazing? Notice Matthew 14, 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him. They worshipped Jesus, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Son of God identifies Jesus with divinity. Son of man identifies Jesus with humanity. And here we find that they worshipped him. Well, what's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's only one that we're to worship, and that's God and him alone. Yes? And yet, Jesus received worship. Jesus never reprimanded the disciples for worshiping him. Jesus never said, hey, hey, fellas, don't, don't worship me. Don't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that, did he? He didn't say, don't worship me. No. He could have, uh, he certainly could have right here, couldn't he? See, and then they even admit it as a truth that Jesus is of that very deity. Now, of course, we see in John, in the book of Revelation, John, this angel appears to John in Revelation 22, 8. And notice how John responds, and notice how the angel responds. Yeah. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now, notice what the angel did. Then saith he unto me, in other words, the angel says to John, See thou do it not. Don't bow down and worship me, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. You see, the whole book of Revelation, the theme of the book of Revelation is that word, worship. And yet, Jesus never told John, no, don't worship me. But yet the angel tells John, oh, don't worship me. 
You're to worship who? God. Jesus received worship. Now, it's amazing how Jehovah's Witnesses translate this. They don't want to use the word worship when it comes to Jesus. They only want to use the word worship when it comes to Jehovah, but not to Jesus. And yet the same word, Old Testament and New Testament, Septuagint, Old Testament, Greek, Greek New Testament, those words to describe the worship of Jehovah is also applied to Jesus. It's amazing. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. He's almost describing the same pictorial we see of the Father in Daniel chapter 7, verses 10, 8, 9, 10. Daniel chapter 7. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like, are like fine brass. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And this very being, who John is seeing, says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the end, the first and the last. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land. O Emmanuel. L. What does that mean? Take counsel, Isaiah 8.10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. For God is with us. Now, you know, a lady sat right here in our 430 study today. And she said, wow. She says, these Old Testament passages are referring to Jesus in the New Testament. She's right on target. Why? Because what does the Bible say about Jesus? The New Testament in reference to Emmanuel. Well, Jesus come on the scene. And you remember in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says his name would be Emmanuel, translated meaning, interpreted meaning, God with us. Now, when we read about Jesus being Jehovah, we find it right here. This is a prophecy that is fulfilled in Jesus. And notice how Jeremiah describes it. In his days Judah shall be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name. Whereby he shall be called the Lord. That's Jehovah friends. Our righteousness. That is a messianic prophecy about Jesus. His name would be called what? The Lord. That is Jehovah. Our righteousness. Now you remember when we were talking about this false teaching of the rapture and we were going through those, seri those different parts. Revelation 1-7 Every eye shall see him. Remember we went through those different parts and we showed there in Daniel 7 24 the 70 weeks and remember it said of thy people and it said of thy, thy holy city and then it said that he would bring in everlasting righteousness. Remember that? Daniel 7, 24. Everlasting righteousness. And this is a prophecy of Jesus. Remember, they had the seven weeks and the 62 weeks and then the one week. And that seven weeks, 62 weeks, the Messiah would come. And that Messiah would bring in everlasting righteousness. And what was the Messiah's name called? Right here he tells you. His name, whereby he shall be called the Lord. That's Jehovah. And Jehovah is God. Yes or no? And Jesus' name would be called the Lord. His name would be called Jehovah, our righteousness. So, when they see Jesus... He is Jehovah in the flesh. When they see Jesus, they see the righteousness of God himself in the flesh. That's amazing thought. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's one Yahweh. That is one Lord. But to us there is but what? One God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, that's Jehovah, my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, that is Jehovah. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, that's Jehovah, thou hast established them for correction. That's Habakkuk. But unto the Son he saith, now God is speaking to his Son, and he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So, Jehovah is God. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, that is Jehovah, he is Elohim. He is God. There is none else beside him. What about Jesus? In the beginning was the Word. And who is the Word? Jesus. And the Word Jesus was with God, and the Word Jesus was God. Not little God, not kind of like God, not sort of God. He is God. Period. The Lord is Jehovah. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord Jehovah of hosts is his name. In his days Judah shall be saved. Remember, I've already read this. His name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, that is who? Jehovah, our righteousness. Now, notice this passage in the New Testament in Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the what? In the name, singular. Not names plural, but name singular. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. This name that they're baptized in, in name, and that is the reference to the character of who God is, is none other than Jehovah. His name is who? Jehovah. You see, the Father is Jehovah in the name, singular. The Son is Jehovah in the name. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is Jehovah in the name. Now, there's those who deny this. And they say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit came forth from the Son. The Holy Spirit is Jesus, or the Holy Spirit is the Father. The Holy Spirit came forth from the Son. So the Holy Spirit here is not a divine being in the Godhead, but simply has come forth from. Well, that's not what the text says. What the text says is in the name of the Father, who is a divine being, yes or no? And the Son, who is a divine being, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if it were true what they're saying, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't have no definite article in Greek. But it's there. See, so what it would say is, if their interpretation were correct, it would say, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. But that's not what it says. No. The definite article is in each one. And the Father's real, isn't he? The Son is real, yes? Now why would the Holy Spirit be any less real if indeed the article is also there in reference to the Holy Spirit? Okay? So if the article wasn't there, then you could say in the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. But that's not what the text says. And these are real divine beings here. The Son is a divine being within the Godhead. Not just some separate, come forth, born, created thing. It's amazing. So what do we have here in Isaiah 26, 4? Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord, that in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In the Lord Jehovah. 
Isaiah 26, 4. Jesus is Jehovah. His name, he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. That's Jehovah. Jehovah's creator. I am the Lord Jehovah that maketh all things. And he did it alone. He did it, he says, by myself. Now, if Jesus isn't this Lord, if Jesus isn't this God, if Jesus isn't the one alone who made all things and by himself, then he's something else. How in the world could God Jehovah say by myself? Notice how John describes what Jesus made. All things were made by him, and the him is Jesus. And without him, that is without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. And yet Jehovah says he did it by himself. Jehovah says he did it alone. Not through someone else, not by someone else, he did it alone. So yet, the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the one who made all things. That's interesting, isn't it? Listen to this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Did God have a beginning? No. Matter of fact, the Bible describes God as being from what? From everlasting, right? Well, what does it say about Jesus? The prophecy in Micah prophesied of Jesus. And notice what Micah 5, 2 says. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he, the he, friends, is Jesus. The he is Jesus. Out of thee shall Jesus come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus has always existed. What Jesus did was come into humanity. So when we look at the divine nature, we see Jesus is the first and the last. Now, in Revelation 1.8, it goes on to say, The Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, by the way, Almighty means all-powerful. The word Almighty means all-powerful. People want to say, well, Jesus uh, is mighty God, not Almighty. But it's interesting because even Jehovah is called mighty God, El Gabor in Hebrew. And so even uh, Jehovah is called mighty God. Now, here we find the term almighty, pantocrator, and pantocrator is two words in Greek, pan meaning all. And then when we have the remaining part of the word, the second word in the compound, you have the word to describe powerful. He is all powerful. And the same type of thing is talking about Jesus. When Jesus says, for example, in Matthew, he says all Power, all authority is given unto me. That was Jesus in Matthew saying the same type of thing. Now, John says in verse 4 of Revelation 1, from him which is and which was and which is to come. And when we were talking about those texts, we covered that thoroughly. Remember, when we went into who is Jesus, we went in four parts of that very thing right here in regard to the deity and the Godhead in verses 4 and 5 of Revelation chapter 1. Now, when we go into Revelation 1 verse 9, John says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So we're looking at that right now, your brother. In other words, he shares in the same type of thing you share in, in trials and tribulation. Matter of fact, it's interesting how the Bible in the book of Revelation describes patience. You see, look up the word patience and see where that's at in, in that whole book. Like, you find patience in Revelation chapter 1. You find patience in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. And notice the parallel there of those who are patient. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? 
that keep the commandments of God and have what? And the faith of Jesus. By the way, is there a difference between having faith in Jesus and having the faith of Jesus? The Bible does refer to having faith in Jesus, but that's not what this text is saying. This text is referring to having the faith of Jesus. Now, friends, you cannot keep this. This is associated with this line right here. You cannot keep the commandments of God unless you have the faith of Jesus. You can't do it. It's impossible. You can't keep the commandments yourself. It's Christ working in you. And how does that happen? By faith. By faith. See, we don't want just the faith in Jesus, which the Bible does talk about that. We want the faith that Jesus had. The kind of faith that Jesus had. See? So, it's having faith in Jesus, and it's having the kind of faith Jesus had. Again, you can't keep the commandments of God if you don't have the kind of faith of Jesus to keep the commandments. Those two are working together. You see? You can't keep the commandments by yourself apart from having the faith of Jesus. So John was not the only one that had suffered persecution and trials. There was others who suffered persecution and trials. That's why John says, I'm your companion, I'm your brother in tribulation. There were others as well being persecuted and suffering for Jesus. Notice how Acts 14, 22 describes it. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. We know that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. See, it's not a one-time thing. It's continually in the faith. So confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. There's going to be those hard times. There's going to be those trials. There's going to be those troubles. But you continue in the faith. Keep the commandments of God. Continue in the faith. You're going to go through tribulation. But the patience don't you wish you knew when you were 16, 17, 18 what you know now? You see, over the years, through experience, we become more patient. See, we learn from our mistakes. We learn from those trials. We learn from those tribulations we go through. We don't want to repeat some of those same things again. Matter of fact, how many times have we regretted the things we've done in the past? And wish we could go back and change all that. So you continue in the faith. And it builds endurance. It builds it, 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 through the trials and the tribulations. It strengthens us. Matter of fact, John's experience of trials developed patience and endurance. Patience here has the meaning of what? Self-control. To endure very difficult situations. Trusting in Jesus, no matter the pressure of persecution. You may be the only one in your family. There may be people that's going to hate you for your belief. There may be those in the community that's going to hate you for what you believe. See? But continue the faith. And know that Jesus is with you. Have the faith that Jesus had. Continue in that faith. And he will be with you through that very difficult time. The pressure we're under is what builds endurance. Those things is what builds our self-control. Jesus is our strength to carry us through. He will be with us during those very difficult times. And then I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos. He was there on the island of Patmos. John was. And he's not talking about being taken into the future there. He's simply saying his location. I, John, was in the isle of Patmos. That's where he was at. Okay? By the way, when I was in the military, I was through here. I've, I've seen the island of Patmos. And um, the island of Patmos is actually, uh, Patmos is a small Greek island in the Aegean Sea, about 50 miles 
southwest of Ephesus. Remember the church Ephesus? That's the very first church we started of the seven churches. So you have Ephesus right here. Well, 50 some miles southwest of Ephesus is where you have Patmos right there. See, and here's the seven churches right here. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. I've been to Smyrna. That's uh, Izmir, Turkey. Modern Izmir, Turkey. And so you have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so here's Patmos right here. Here's where John wrote the letters to the seven churches right there. And what is the reason for why John is on the island of Patmos? What is his reason? The purpose is for defending what? The word of God. He's telling you, for this reason, this is why he's here. He's on Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is confined to Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, let's see how this works. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says something very interesting. It says, and the dragon, that's a symbol of Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, see that, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here you have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 1, who bear record, John is to bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things he saw. So here you have the word of God and you have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The other one you had those who keep the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now notice how the Old Testament describes this. It's interesting that you could find words, different words used to describe the same thing. Now watch this. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. By the way, have you ever heard people say the law did not exist before Mount Sinai when God came down on Mount Sinai? Right? Have you ever heard people say that? They say, well, you know, the Ten Commandments didn't come until Mount Sinai. But what's interesting is Sodom and Gomorrah was long before Moses at Mount Sinai. Matter of fact, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, was dealing with Abraham and Lot long before Mount Sinai. Now notice how Isaiah describes this very thing. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of where? Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now friends, this isn't after Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. He's talking about what happened prior to Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. Sodom and Gomorrah, after its destruction, didn't even exist anymore. Yes or no? It was destroyed. By the way, the Bible refers to that destruction as eternal fire. You know that? Eternal fire. Well, my mother-in-law, my wife's mother, went to Sodom and Gomorrah on a tour. She went to Israel, and she went on this tour, and they showed her the site of where Sodom and Gomorrah was supposed to have been. And she was there. And she came back, and I asked her, I said, now, you're telling me you went to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And she said, yes. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, how could you have stood right there? Because it said that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was eternal fire. Was the fire still burning there? We're going to talk about another subject in the future. You see? Eternal fire. That's how the Bible describes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, what do we find here in reference to the people of Gomorrah? We find the law of who? God. How can that be if the law didn't happen until Mount Sinai? You know, as I've said before, what God did at Mount Sinai was simply write it in codified form. He wrote it so they could see it. Prior to that time, the law of God was in the heart. And Jesus came to restore the law of God in the heart. That's what the new covenant is. The new covenant. He says, I will put my law where? In your heart. You see, that's the new covenant based on what Jesus has done. 
is doing and will do. See? So here we find it right there. Now notice how the interchangeable words could be used. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You see, it's interesting because, for example, words are, different words are sometimes used to describe the same thing. Especially when you go to the book of Psalms 119 and you read through there, it's amazing the words used to describe the same thing. And, and uh, it's like Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry. You see, when we think of our poetry in the English language, we think of lines that rhyme, don't we? We think of lines that rhyme with each. But in Hebrew poetry, different words are used to say the same thing. Let me give you an example. You take your Bible and you turn to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16 and in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, well, let's look at that verse for a second. Isaiah chapter 8, and look at verse 16. And this is going to give you an idea exactly what I'm talking about. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. And notice what the Bible says in verse 16. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. Isaiah 8.16. You see, bind and seal are referring to the same thing, yes or no? And testimony and law are referring to the same exact thing. Bind up the testimony, seal the law. Law and testimony are talking about the same exact thing. Bind and seal is talking about the same exact thing. Now, is the law ever called a testimony? Well, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. For example, Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. And this isn't the only place. There are many places that it says this kind of thing in regard to the testimony and the law. Notice verse 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, Two tables, got that? Two tables. What are those two tables? Right. But what are those two tables called? The law. Two tables of testimony. See, so is this testimony the law or not the law? Yes or no? It is, isn't it? This testimony is the law. Okay, so different words sometimes are used to describe the same exact thing. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the shaft, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. You see? So it's interesting, the parallel here. By the way, cast away and despised are correlating with each other, correct? Cast away, despised. You could, you could think of a word that would imply both of those things, like reject. Yes? Because they have what? Rejected the law of God, or and they have rejected the word of the Holy One. Yes? You see? So... There's different words to describe the same thing. Cast away, despised, that kind of thing. So when we go to Isaiah 8.20, we find to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. So the word law and testimony is referring to the same thing, yes? To the law and to the testimony. The words law and testimony are words to describe the same thing. And, and we see this in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Book of Revelation. And the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his 
testament. That word there for testament is uh, the word to describe covenant. Now here we find the covenant where? In heaven, in the temple, in heaven, the covenant. The ark of his covenant. Now watch this. In Revelation 15, 5, and after that I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Now, here he uses the tabernacle of the testimony. What is that testimony? The same thing as that covenant that was in verse 19 of chapter 11, the law. There's only two arcs mentioned in the whole Bible. Either Noah's Ark or the Ark that held the Ten Commandments. Okay? And when you go to the Old Testament to find out what the tabernacle of the testimony is, this is referring to the Ten Commandments. This has no other meaning throughout the entire Bible. No other meaning. This testimony is the covenant. This testimony is the Ten Commandments that was in the Ark of the covenant. That's what it was called. So, for our study tonight, what do we come up with in these passages? The Word of God. This was the purpose. John was on the island of Patmos. For the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, and it's interesting because the prophets of old prophesied of the law and the prophets. You find that all through the Bible. And actually it was the prophets and those Bible writers actually wrote the Bible. And they pointed to what? The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now next Wednesday, <clears throat> next Wednesday, we'll be in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me the great voice of a trumpet. Now here John is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Study that text between now and next Wednesday. Read that passage. Study it out. And we're going to look at that carefully. So we're going to do next Wednesday a Lord's Day seminar. And it'll be in parts. And what we're going to look at is this text right here. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. Now you see in our studies we've gone from Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 all the way through. Now we're looking at chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We're going to study that in parts. We're going to go through the early church fathers, like Ignatius, Barnabas, uh, Justin Martyr, Tertullian. We're going to go through the early church fathers, and we're going to point out some things that a lot of people haven't seen on these church fathers. Matter of fact, most people have never even read the church fathers. They quote some things out of the church fathers, and they've never even actually read the church fathers. People have quoted things and they parrot what they've been taught and they've not even looked at it for themselves. But we're going to go into the church fathers. Then we're going to go into the history of the church through the centuries. And so we're going to look at Revelation 1.10 in parts. Just like we did when we were talking about the rapture theory and some of the other things in Revelation chapter 1 where... John says that he sees Jesus there in Revelation 1, 7. He says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And then we got into parts about that when we were talking about the second coming of Jesus and how Jesus was, is coming. And so it's very important to understand that. Well, we need to find out what is this Lord's Day. We're going to look at that next Wednesday. And if you get a chance to invite somebody, just invite them. Invite them. And we're doing a, a Lord's Day seminar. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for our study tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead us. And Lord, we just want to thank you for your mercy, your grace, and long-suffering. Teach us, Lord, what you want us to know that we may share with others. We, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.